<laughs> you should see me the rest of the day. I'm like, ah! or I'm, you know, depressed, or I've got no makeup on, I've got pimples everywhere, I'm feeling yeah. like a slob, and I'm just having a shit day. Um, but then I'll go and I'll post a photo that looks nothing like I look right now. Hello there. How's it going? Hello there. Good. How are you? Good. Thanks. And thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure. It's um, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you. How's the weather in Melbourne? It should be a warm day, yeah? Uh, it's been up and down. We had one day that hit 30 degrees Celsius. And then today, I think it's going to be pretty cold. Oh. It's just up and down. It's yeah, just, typical, it's typical, typical Melbourne, weather. yeah. So I'm really happy that I'm hearing that uh, restrictions are being eased in Melbourne and you were in a very tough lockdown for a while. How long was the lockdown for? Oh my gosh, uh, a long time. Yeah, was it more <laughs> than had, two months? It, well, we had two lockdowns. I don't even really know what went on because we had one big lockdown and then we managed to get down to only having a few cases a day. And then I don't know what happened a whole combination of things yeah. I don't know riots people not following the rules like just a whole heap of things occurred yeah. and then next minute we're up to 700 cases and then we had to go into another lockdown again yeah but now I think the main restrictions are eased yeah is it much better now well yeah now you can go to restaurants cafes you still have to wear masks though all the time mm -hmm. yeah uh, what kind of masks do you wear like normal masks white masks or very kind of stylish ones I have one here. I just um, I just wear the medical one, the blue oh, one. Ah, yeah, yeah. I actually um, I was wearing the face mask. This is a clear one. Mm. But because Shield. I was when wearing the ones that go across here, I was getting all these, uh, getting all these breakouts. Yeah, yeah. And that's so, that's uh, an issue for people who are kind of performers or models, actresses. One of the many mm. drawbacks of this pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably the least of our worries, but yeah. yes, it, it's not It's not nice to have that on top of everything else. Um, yeah, I've started getting spots where the mask would sit here as well. Yeah. And... Okay. Anyway. Yeah, hopefully it's getting yeah. better. Yeah. And I want to link this lockdown to a subject that uh, is one of my main points in this interview, and that's mental health. So... Mm -hmm. As you might know, this lockdown has wreaked havoc on people's mental health in many par parts of the world. And I just want to ask, what uh, did it affect you much in terms of stress, anxiety and lack of motivation? And what did, if yes, what did you do to cope with those uh, kind of situations? Well, luckily for me, I don't think I was too heavily affected because I do a lot of work from home anyway with social media and I'm quite an introverted person. I, oh. I like staying at home and I like keeping to myself, but I'm not big on going out, drinking or socializing much. Uh, so it didn't make a big difference for me, but I, I know people that it really badly affected. I think one of the big key points for me is that I tried to exercise regularly, tried yeah. to lift weights, tried to go out. But even that, it's hard to do when you're on your own at home, getting that motivation. And um, I think it would be a massive help to be able to maintain exercise during yeah. these sorts of times. It would help a lot with mental health. But like I said, it's hard to get that motivation, yeah. especially when you're already feeling down. And I know people that were really badly affected and it's quite upsetting to, to watch those around you and people you love suffer. Exercise is a, a very prominent way to tackle these stresses in lockdown. But working out at home can be hard because many people usually work at gyms or uh, mm -hmm. under guidance of a personal trainer and how, how did you learn to work at home and you said you lifted weight so do you have kind of a complete set of dumbbells or bars um, I've got a few weights at home but I was seeing a personal trainer so sometimes online because for me I um, I I really need to be held accountable I need someone to be telling me what to do because otherwise I'm like okay that's enough <laughs> time to end the workout uh, but yeah, I've got a few weights at home and I'd go for walks as well. Yeah. 
So try and do that sort of thing. But luckily, before lockdown, I'd already gotten in the habit of working out regularly. And I think that helped me be able to maintain it. Yeah. And uh, do you do meditation as well? Because that's a very popular word too. No, I wish. <laughs> oh, yeah. So have you ever tried it or? I have. Yeah. I get a bit distracted. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm next. on my yeah. phone and but i think education is probably a very good thing and it should be encouraged yeah it's interesting that you said uh social media has helped you to maintain your mental health and to a uh, pivot the effects of lockdown because many people say that the addictive side of social media it's kind of worsened in lockdown and that's um making their life worse not better but there's a documentary on netflix now a new one called social dilemma <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> many people are talking about that, that kind of negative effects of social media. Although personally, I think social media has many advantages, just like many other tools and technologies that we use. I just want to know how do you think uh, social media is affecting mental health that outside of lockdown in general of people? I think people spend, I'm just talking from personal experience here as well. Uh, I think people don't realize just how much time they'll spend on a phone, sitting there, scrolling, yeah. messaging. Snapchat, Instagram, whatever. I, I just think that time sort of slips away. Yeah. We don't notice it. And I think that's probably one of the dangerous things is we don't actually realize just how long we are spending on a phone. Yeah. But humans are procrastinators in general. Like, let's say we didn't have social media. We'd probably be staring <laughs> at a wall or we'd be sitting out. <laughs> we don't even realize what we're thinking about and what we're doing. Yeah. Like there's only so much time a human can really sit down and spend working and being productive during the day. And we procrastinate regardless. Yeah. So whether it be with a phone or something else, yeah. I think that we will find ways to do it. So have it you seen that documentary? Yeah, I watched it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I thought it was really good. And I think that people, people should be aware. And it is, it is a good thing, social media, I think, in a lot yeah. of ways. But too much of a good thing can be bad yeah. too. Do you think they have the producers of that documentary have an agenda behind it? You know, it's because these social media platforms, they are now giant companies and they're making so much profit. So it's natural to have enemies who are making these documentaries to affect their profit and income. Do you think there's kind of agenda behind it? Or you think the producers of that documentary are only thinking about a benefit of people? I mean, I haven't really thought about this until you asked me this question now. <laughs> uh, I think in order to be able to produce a documentary you've got to have some sort of drive or motivation in the first place to want to do it i think that they're probably coming from a more personal place i don't think that their agenda is driven necessarily by profits yeah like other industries or other big corporations they do seem to be individuals behind the documentary mm. but I, i just don't know the facts Oh, yeah, cool. So I, I want to talk about two different ways because we mostly talked about addiction and social media. But currently people in, are divided into two groups, people on social media. One group are people who uh, are consumers of content and the other people are producers, like what they call influencers. So for mm -hmm. consumers, there's an aspect of seeing all of these happy and wealthy images on social media and comparing their own life. And that could induce a lot of mental health issues like depression and anxiety. And for producers, there's another aspect which is unseen. And that's the competitive aspect of this industry. I mean, being an influencer, because you have to be always thinking about new ways of grabbing uh, attention and uh, growing your followers. And uh, because and you're doing it full time, you know, it's it's a very kind of unstable job when you have a nine to five job and you have an employer. It's very stable. You have you, you know, your own uh, working hours and you don't need to be that creative. So let's talk about the first aspect on consumers. What do you think people can do to prevent comparing that much and that side of mental health issue with social media? I think that's a fantastic question. And I think it's something that children should be asked in schools too, because social media is such a big part of our lives today yeah. that we do need to take into account how can we have a healthy relationship with it? Because unfortunately for a lot of people that wish we didn't have a relationship with social media, it is a big part of our society and it seems like it's here to stay. Yeah. So we are gonna have a relationship with it regardless and how can we make it the healthiest possible? I think for me as an influencer, there is like you said, that competitive side. So you see other influencers, they have more followers, they take 
photos that you don't take and you think, should I be taking those types of photos? Should I be doing what they're doing? So from a personal place, I don't follow people that make me question me. So I follow people that I find inspiring and really creative for me. Um, don't make me feel bad about my body, uh, what, how I dress, how I live, what I drive, any of that. And I think the same goes for consumers too. They need to be following people that make them feel good about themselves. And I think that every time you follow someone and you look at their pictures, you really need to stop and you need to ask yourself, does this picture they posted or does their page make me feel good about myself? Should I be following this person? Like what feeling am I getting from it? I think that would make a massive difference for people's relationships on social media. And just because someone might make you feel bad doesn't mean that they're yeah. a bad person on social media. They're just not for you. Yeah, and most of uh, famous people on Instagram, they only show their happy moments and they might have very dark minutes during the day and they're not showing that. Yeah, do you agree with that? Oh yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a case in point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those people. <laughs> yeah. You should see me the rest of the day. I'm like, ah! <laughs> or I'm, you know, depressed or I've got no makeup on, I've got pimples everywhere. I'm feeling yeah. like a slob. I'm just having a shit day. Um, but then I'll go and I'll post a photo that looks nothing like I look right now. Sort of yeah. thing. I might be yeah. there sitting in bed like, <laughs> and I'm posting a pretty picture. Yeah, I think that's um, a very important point that people have, have to constantly remember and remind to, to themselves that every person has some downtime. And, oh yeah, so. I think it's just it's human nature. We yeah. all we all it's it's impossible to be happy all the time. Yeah, it's impossible to look fantastic all the time. Like it's just not it's not normal. It's yeah. not natural. About the anxiety of it as a producer of content, how do you manage this? Because I know you're on many different platforms, Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. Do you have help? Like someone who edits your videos on YouTube or do you edit? No, if you look closely, you can tell that they're edited by me because <laughs> the editing is not very good. But how do I you have time? Yeah. Phone. Yeah. How do you have time to manage all of these accounts? It's my full time job. Modeling is now my full time job, social media. So, and I really enjoy it. I really enjoy going and posting different content. Obviously, I have help from photographers, from people taking video of me, but then I'll go and distribute that content out myself. Yeah. Uh, I mean, full time job is usually uh, nine to five. Do you have some hours during the day that you promise to not to do anything related to your work? Uh, well, the good thing about my work is it doesn't feel too much like work. I don't dedicate certain hours. I think in an ideal word, world, it would be nice to say, all right, I'm going to wake up at this time. I'm going to work from this time to this time. Then I'm going to take a break. But for me, I'll wake up. I might feel like not working in that moment. And then I might feel like jumping online, posting some images and then maybe editing a video. Sometimes I'm working at midnight. I sort of just go with the flow. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the life of a creative in general. Yeah. Someone that and creates you're... content, the art, music, video. We don't follow sort of a schedule. It's just sort of when the motivation's there. And you don't find that uh, annoying or destructive to your health or anything at all? Oh, I think because I enjoy it so much that it, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't feel like an issue. It doesn't feel too much like work. Yeah. Um, there's probably things I can do to improve my mental health yeah. more. <laughs> How's your sleep? But how how many bad. hours per day do you get normally? Maybe seven to eight or nine. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's very like, good. I sleep pretty, pretty well. Like I don't wake up too much in the middle hmm. of the night. I sleep pretty well. Yeah. Through. I'm normally fed by midnight. I think that's why you can manage all of these pressures from different accounts and, and having yeah. a good sleep studies shows I'm that very, it's the most I'm important. I'm very lucky to have that because yeah. a lot of people struggle with in, insomnia or they struggle falling asleep at night. People in the creative industry are renowned for not having normal sleep patterns, for taking drugs, for self-medicating, for because it, it is, <clears throat> um, yeah, it does take a toll. I guess it is hard. You're not working that normal nine to five job. But yeah. yeah, I'm lucky. I haven't I haven't had that problem yet. Touch wood. Yeah, <laughs> I'm touching wood. Uh, are you active on LinkedIn too? No. Oh yeah. So on LinkedIn, usually they have one occupation to introduce them themselves with one thing. What would you call yourself, model, influencer, activist? Yeah. Well, see, Instagram has that too. There's like a little thing just underneath your name, yeah, and yeah, it yeah. says 
fashion model. Yeah, yeah. And I had to, I was, it said artist initially. Yeah. I, I put up there and then I went, oh, maybe am I an art? Like, yes, I'm an artist, but maybe I should just go with model. So I just now fashion model. That's what I go by. If I have to pick one thing, it's oh. like, I, I'm okay but yeah i guess all the other things sort of fall under it artist activist yeah but the overarching umbrella title would probably be model cool and i know you're kind of an activist too and especially about body positivity and you have a very famous interview with bbc international yeah <laughs> this is oh my god like five years ago yeah. yeah so i reckon you're one of the pioneers in that movement and uh, Maybe, yeah. and I think when we talk about plus size models in world, you're one of the first faces that come into mind. So have you seen much change since you started? Huge amount of change. Yeah. Um, and I, I definitely think I'm one of the sort of people that push body positivity, but there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of change in the industry before I came into it that allowed me to be able to start working in the industry. Like there were women pioneering well before me as well that, that made enough of a change so that I could enter the industry myself. And so I continued to push the message as well. And I think we've gotten to a point now, at least in Australia, America, and probably the UK, uh, where we do seem to have models of different sizes on most photo shoots, most campaigns these days. Yeah. So I think it's become the norm. Now. Because I'm from Iran and uh, some people in Iran might not be familiar with body positivity. Can you briefly give an explanation about this notion? So body positivity is, it's where I suppose you look at yourself and in, in a, as a whole and you accept the different things about yourself that don't necessarily fit into what we're told is beautiful. Yeah. So we might be told in the media, I don't know how it is in Iran, I don't know what sort of models or actresses you are shown on media and in the newspapers and magazines, but it might be all very similar body types or very similar skin or hair. And if you don't look like them, you might feel a bit shit about yourself. Yeah. You might not feel that fantastic. You might say, oh, maybe I should lose a bit of weight. Maybe I should change my hair color. Maybe I should do this or that. Whereas body positivity is basically saying, it doesn't matter what you're told is beautiful. You need to embrace what you have, your shape, the way you look, the way you talk, the way you move, everything about you as a person, even if you're told that you shouldn't feel good about it. Yeah. You should. <laughs> I, yeah. I that was a bit of a mouthful, but yeah, I hope that made sense. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And also, so, yeah. it's a kind of related to fashion industry too, because during your interview with BBC, I, I saw you said that there are some models that are deemed plus size, and some models are ordinary catwalk model, and then we have plus size model. And when we say plus size, we imagine that a stereotype image, but you said that a very big group of models are falling into plus size. and you wanted to change that. Yeah, well, the fashion industry seems to want to categorize people a lot that don't fit into that stereotypical, very, very skinny look of the very thin girl. Um, and so when we started having models come into the industry that weren't a size eight Australian, or I think it's size two US or four, um, what happened was they started getting labeled as plus size, even if they were only a size bigger or two sizes bigger. It's just everyone got labeled plus size that didn't fit into that tiny, skinny idea that the modeling industry had been pushing for so long. And so I said, why are we labeling them at all? Just call them models. You don't need to put them in another category. You, you need to stop differentiating them because that also puts this idea into the public's mind that, oh, look, it's great. Yeah, we've got models of different sizes, but we're going to call them plus size. They're not normal models. They're these plus size models. And so, yeah, I just tried to, I tried to break that down and say, we need to stop. We need to stop doing this. We need to start normalizing different body types mm, yeah cool thanks for the formative explanation for the next part of interview i just want to talk about different platforms of social media there are some newer platforms like tic tac and snapchat that you're uh, active on them too do you try any new platform when it comes out or you wait until it gains purchase i generally as soon as a platform i hear about it and if people are on it, I'm like, oh, I better jump on it. Yeah. <laughs> I better create an account there. You just uh, create an account or start me, creating content too? Yeah, I guess because content 
it can be a little bit different depending on what platform you're using. Like Twitter, you can post uncensored pictures, you can post nudity, you can yeah. post a lot more uh, than you can, can post, say, on Instagram or Facebook or, or get removed on those accounts. And then TikTok, uh, it's all like little videos. And so that's a different sort of content as well. So I sort of, yeah, I'll create content that suits the different social media sites. What do you think about TikTok? I, I personally, I haven't installed TikTok. I didn't want to get addicted to something new. You're obviously different to me. Your fans, I think, expect you to be active on all platforms. They want to follow you everywhere. Do you produce special content for TikTok? Yeah, I do. I'll create, because the videos have to be long on yeah. TikTok. Yeah. And a little bit faster, shorter, you know, definitely have fun happening music over it. So it is a different, it is a different style of content and I'll produce videos specifically for TikTok. Yeah. The other thing is by jumping on new social medias for me, I'm also able to reach a new audience. Mm -hmm. Audiences do vary. Like a lot of people aren't on Twitter, for example, that are on Instagram or yeah. vice versa. And so I do like to jump onto these new social medias so I can reach new audiences. And I already with TikTok, I've noticed that I'm reaching countries that I'm not reaching on say Instagram or yeah. Facebook. So out of these three platforms, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok, which one do you like most and spend your time maybe as a consumer? Oh, as a consumer, yeah. Instagram. Yeah. Or TikTok come second yeah. and then Snapchat, I don't really use it as a consumer at all. I just jump on there to occasionally post photos because I uh, know some people really like Snapchat. So I'm like, yeah. oh, I'll quickly jump on there and post yeah. something. And Instagram has Snapchat. recently added a feature called Reels, which is kind yes. of to uh, compete with uh, Tic Tac. Do you think they'll be successful with that? I don't know. They were very successful with stories that they yeah. most likely uh, were influenced by Snapchat. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. what do you think? And that's done very well for Instagram. So it is possible that Reels will do well. IGTV, I think, also came as a bit of an answer to YouTube. Yeah. It was, it was brought in so you can But it's not that uh, successful, I think. It can't no, really I don't compete. Use yeah. TV at all. And there's another aspect of um, IGTV that you can't monetize. There's no possibility to monetize your videos on IGTV. So let's go to YouTube. I checked your YouTube account too, and uh, you can easily get over 4 million views in a few weeks. And congratulations. <laughs> <It just happened laughs> <at once. laughs> one of your uh, kind of backstage of your, one of your photo shoots and gotten up to 4 million views in three weeks, which is huge. It's... I don't know. It surprised me. I went, how? How did that happen? Yeah. I'm not... <laughs> Does that encourage you to get more active on YouTube when you see that oh, kind of... Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because for a long time on YouTube, I would think I was sitting around 14,000 followers for a very, very long time. I started creating a bit more content. And then when you do, you see that your content is reaching people. You think, oh, it's worth putting time and effort into because it's, yeah. it's reaching people. And it definitely encourages you to create more. I'd like to ask you about monetization on YouTube. You can skip this question if you want. Uh, and let's, oh. let's have a look. Yeah. Let's have a look. <laughs> okay, so a lot of my videos aren't monetized, especially the ones that end up reaching a few people. Okay, luckily my latest video is still monetized. Yeah. That one. I'll hold it here. That one's still monetized. Mm -hmm. And then it's like you can just see that a lot of them don't get monetized or the music gets copyrighted and then I can't monetize why, it. Why don't you use uh, copyright free music? Because I do. It, I, I've heard that for 1 million views, you can raise around like 15,000 US dollars. No, look, this is the video that reached 4 million views. Yeah. Look at how much money I made. Oh my God. <laughs> That's interesting. And I, I, thanks for showing that. This is, I think uh, a lot of people um, want to know that. I, I grabbed that music from iMovies uh, on Library. my phone. Yeah. I thought it must be copyright free and it sounds copyright free. I tell you what, it's not a great song. So I was like, oh, this will be fine. Like, but no, nah, I think it got copyrighted. Oh my God. Away and I was like, oh, never mind. Easily like around $40,000 slip from your hand. <laughs> The other thing is, no, because my videos are very short. So it also yeah. depends on how long a video yeah, goes yeah, yeah. for and how long people watch it. So I don't know. Let's have a look. All right. This one is monetized still and it's got over a million views. Yeah. So let's have a look what the revenue was there. Revenue, $140 for one month. So let's make it 
all time. How much money? I okay, seven hundred and twenty dollars on this one yeah. video. Hmm. So that video got one and a half million views or whatever. It's been monetized yeah. since the start. How long was that? Sorry. For, how long does it go for? The video, yeah. Uh, one minute thirty. Hmm. So, oh, it's not that much the because the, video, the less money you make. Yeah. yeah, people think that YouTube just based on views, but it's not. Yeah, YouTubers are making a lot of money, but that's why they are receiving ads and get affiliated with brands because it's yeah, that, that, YouTube is YouTube. kind of exploiting people. Oh, it is. It is. It's oh, it's terrible because the other thing is YouTube like normally an agency, right? They'll take 20%, maybe like 10% on top of that. YouTube takes something like 70% and you're left with just a little bit of the money. Yeah. Like they're taking most of the money from advertisers yeah. and you're seeing a small percentage. This is one of the things that's wrong with social media. And I think the social media dilemma does talk about this. It's like no other corporations, no other businesses would be allowed to get away with treating because we're basically employees. Like we're creating content for these yeah. sites. Like we create content for YouTube that brings people in. People are watching it. Like we are creating shows for YouTube sort of thing. Yeah. Yet we are getting paid nothing. We're not getting treated right. They can remove our entire accounts if they yeah. want to. They have full they control. Content if they want to. No other business or corporation can do that. They can't yeah. just fire you all of a sudden. They have to give reason. You can appeal it. Whereas with these social media accounts, they have full control over your, your livelihood. Like for me, if Instagram wanted to, they could remove my account and that's that's my biggest platform. And what can I do? There's nothing I can do. There's nowhere I can go to. The government can't help. Like, what do you do? Nothing. Yeah, that's a very good point to talk about. And I think in near future, we'll see more uh, conversation around that idea because these social platforms and all of them, like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, they're getting out of hand, out of control. They're owning the world. And they even kind of censor U.S. President Donald Trump tweets currently in the very kind of debatable election results in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think because this is now political, in near future, we will hear much more about limiting social media outlets power and in U.S. Senate or other uh, political bodies. And hopefully it will get better. Yeah, it definitely needs to be regulated more. Yeah. They need to be more people need to be able to reach someone like I can't just call someone up at Instagram and say hi um, I had a photo removed can you talk to me about you can't call anyone you can't contact anyone yeah if you in any other business there's helplines there's call you know you can call someone up you might be on hold for five hours but you get through to someone eventually with these corporate like these social medias you can't talk to anyone you're alone the other thing is it was really it was scary when Instagram was sold to Facebook because yeah. It's like, I would much rather all of these different social media accounts be independently owned. Like, yeah. But the fact that they're buying up these other ones, they're just becoming these massive, big corporate industries that have more and more power and yeah. control. And it's scary. Like, I wish that Instagram was still independently independent from Facebook, but, you know, it's not. Yeah. Thank you for talking bravely about that. And do you listen to podcasts? I listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was. I listened while I was doing my makeup this morning. Uh, BuzzFeed Unsolved, and they do unsolved mysteries podcasts on them. I'm. I love to listen to unsolved crimes, and yeah, that's uh -huh. that's my big one. And then also podcasts by psychologists talking about different mental health traits or disorders and things like that. But yeah, no, I'm a big podcast consumer. Love it. I think that idea that uh, social media is getting control of our lives and they're not kind of responding to customers, basically. It's a good uh, topic for podcasts because they are very in independent media outlets. One of the uh, podcasts that is talking about this is Joe Rogan. Have you ever listened to Joe Rogan? Are you a fan of him? I have. I'm not a big fan of him oh. <laughs> because I'm pretty sure he is getting a little bit of money from the meat and dairy industry. Oh. He seems be very oh. anti-vegan and very yeah, yeah. pro me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, these are things that are destroying our planet faster than anything else. And then you've got Joe Rogan, who's the biggest podcaster in the world, basically, yeah. um, sounding like he's pro pro meat and dairy. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure he's getting money. Like I think that yeah. there's an agenda there. 
I don't like him because of it. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, as you would know, I'm vegan and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm pro animal rights, and I also think that the biggest thing that any individual can do for the planet right now is cut out animal products from their diet because it's just destroying our forests yeah. and our land. And then you've got dickheads like him. <laughs> basically <laughs> carrying on about how fabulous meat is and it's like yeah. shut up where are you are you getting paid for this i'm pretty sure you're making money from this <laughs> i agree with you on that department but i like the way that he interviews people and i kind of was inspired by him in this interview i don't know if i succeeded or not oh, but no and i just shut all over him um <laughs> i think no that he is i did i have listened to quite a few of his podcasts like there is a a feeling of Like it seems a bit relaxed. He seems quite open-minded. Yeah. He, he does like he can. He seems to understand and listen. Um, but he does. He does it well. Yeah, there are many podcasts like him who are talking now about social me media control over our lives. And with that documentary on Netflix, uh, we can hope that in future uh, things will be different. I've come to an end, and I don't want to take more of your time. Our audience might know that I had a photo shoot a while ago, like in February with you, which is around like ten months ago. And oh, yeah, yeah, and I'm I I would really like to collaborate with you again, hopefully after this pandemic. Hopefully, lockdown lit. Yeah. Again, because I um I wouldn't mind going up north, getting a bit of sun and a bit oh, of Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when was the last time that you were in Queensland? I think 2018. Oh, last year I was in Brisbane for a photo shoot. Yeah, so yeah, if if I can see you here, that would be great. And this was my first interview ever. I was oh, kind I of love... nervous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. It was an honor for me and great pleasure. And I hope you enjoy your rest of your weekend and. Hope to see you again soon and work with you. Thank you. You too. No worries. Bye.